like the main. Okay. All right. So. Um, does anybody not have a Does anybody not have a copy of the new homework assignment? Yep. Yep. I unfortunately uh, wasn't able to grade your assignments that you gave back on Monday because of a family emergency. So I didn't have any time yesterday. But I should have them to you on Friday. I did re read your comments though, which the most common comment was to make the homework harder. So I don't know if you want to egg each other on, but, um, but uh, I will make some attempt to make the homework slightly harder. But I, I'm sure that you didn't mean that too seriously. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, factoring primes. And by the way, I will summarize the comments from, from your feedback next time. But we're going to talk about factoring primes, which sounds paradoxical until you um, learn that a very famous person made the following statement in his, in his famous book, um, The Obvious Mathematical breakthrough. Would be development <laughs> of an easy way to factor large prime numbers. Of his book, The Road Ahead, first edition. Corrected in the second. Corrected in the second, and in fact, he changed it in the second to say that the obvious mathematical breakthrough, breakthrough that would defeat our public key encryption would be the development of an easy way to factor large numbers, which is actually only partially true because there are a lot of public key crypto systems which would not be broken by factoring large numbers, but it's more correct. But it's possible maybe this is what he really meant. Um, he, was, he was, after all, a math major um, a long time ago at Harvard. He even took a math class from John Tate a long, long ago um, before he quit. And uh, maybe he really meant factoring large prime numbers. In fact, maybe, he, maybe Bill is, in fact, an algebraic number theorist. <laughs> and what he really meant, um, he just wanted to dumb the statement down for the general public. But what he really meant was the obvious mathematical breakthrough would be the following. Suppose you have a number field k, and you consider inside of it the ring of integers OK. Um, a really critical thing that comes up a lot in algebraic number theory is writing p times OK, where here p is a prime number. So p is either 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on, um, as a product of prime ideals, pi to the ei where these pi in O sub k are prime ideals. In other words, the phrase factoring large primes, or any primes in fact, is completely sensible um, in the context of algebraic number theory. And in fact, this um, factoring of rational primes as products of primes in O sub k uh, turns out to be maybe the central idea, or the central thing to look at in algebraic number theory. It's amazingly important for a huge amount of different things in algebraic number theory. Um, for example, if you look at the last problem on the homework, it asks you to take uh, two cubic number fields and factor a whole bunch of primes and just count how many factors there are and then try to guess about some sort of density pattern. And um, that's sort of just a little taste of what's called the Chebotard density theorem. And also understanding the splitting behavior, as it's called, of a prime in the rational numbers uh, when multiplied by OK in terms of primes and O sub K, understanding the splitting behavior is really uh, very, very central in algebraic number theory. So maybe that's what Bill is really talking about. I don't know. <coughs> so this is the problem we're going to look at for the rest of the week. And it turns out that for all the finitely many prime numbers P, there's a fairly straightforward way to compute this factorization. But for finitely many primes, it's actually much, much more complicated. But not slow. It's very fast, just complicated. OK? So that's what I'll explain. Is that for any given number field? Yes. Yes. For a fixed number field, 
This is only, this is never actually hard from a technical point of view. Only it's hard to explain how to do it. Okay. Um, yeah, so you fix a number field. In particular, the very, um, the very shocking thing is that you don't need to know O sub k. You don't have to compute O sub k in order to compute this factorization, which sounds completely absurd at first glance, because how can you even write down the answer if you don't know O sub k? So here's what I mean by the answer. Um, if I, so throughout this week, we're going to be really um, interested in something that takes as input a prime number p in the integers, and it has as output um, something that looks like this. So product pi the ei, where we actually write pi as the ideal generated by the number p here, and one particular element of OK, which I'll just call alpha. Maybe I'll call it alpha i because of the i there. Here, alpha i is an OK. So k, k is part of the alpha. Uh, yes, yes, certainly. Sorry. Uh, so a number field k. and a prime number of p. And the output is this factorization. The key thing here is that we will prove, not, um, we may accidentally halfway prove it now, but we'll prove much more carefully in general and kind of a more natural way using a generalization of the Chinese remainder theorem, that any ideal of O sub k, uh, any prime ideal, well, any ideal of O sub k has the form an integer n is generated by an integer n and then some element of O sub k. In other words, it isn't the case that every ideal is principal, but every ideal is generated by at most two elements, or one of them can be taken to be an integer. And therefore, even if you can't write down O sub k because it's too hard and requires factoring the discriminant, or at least finding the square free, or the squares that divide the discriminant, you can at least write down these ideals without actually computing OK. All you need to do to write down the answer is to write down an integer and an element alpha in OK. And that's something that doesn't actually require knowing OK. So the output is really these numbers alpha sub i and the exponents e sub i. It's not the actual primes as subsets of O sub k, which of course are infinite. That doesn't really make sense. OK? So just for clarity. All right, so now um, uh, I think I'll put this. Well, there's a picture in the notes, if you look here, which kind of looks like a curve and another curve. This is the cover of a book called The Number Field Sieve by Lemstra and Lemstra. And I'm going to um, just make a few remarks about this geometric view of factory, which just go along with things you saw in the homework and remarks I've already made in class. This should feel very familiar to you. That's a good question. Sure. If you are able to get a bunch of a, uh, alpha i's of this mm -hmm. form that you mm -hmm. know are in OK, That's right. doesn't this kind of give you a way to almost tell you exactly what OK is? Like, you, you're sort of able to generate a bunch of these elements yeah. that are in OK. Yeah, they work wonderfully. You just have to know which primes to factor. But if you sort of went up prime by prime up and you yeah. keep getting more things, so like you could that would be. In fact, that's I mean, it basically gives you an algorithm to compute OK. Unfortunately, it doesn't know where to stop. That's yeah. The well, yeah, you don't know when to stop. But it's not even so much that that um, you can easily write down a number field that doesn't look that complicated, but for which you have to trial primes up to you know ten to the twenty if you're going to do something like that. What you really want to do is it's kind of kind of like what you're describing is factoring the discriminant by trial division. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not such a good idea. Right. By the way, somebody asked me um, in the mailing list about the relation between finding the maximal order, the string of integers, and integer factorization. Who is that? Your like, first week of class. Well, whoever it was, they disappeared, I guess. Was, was it you? I think no. it might have been me. Yeah, I think it was you. What's your name again? Dan. Dan, yeah, I think it was you. So I found um, that, in fact, in my book, I actually have a remark about this, which I've forgotten about, um, which I should mention. So what was the question again? So, so the question is the following. Since you're concerned with computing O sub k, and you want to kind of fit into the context of computational complexity, in the sense of you know, computer science, 
Um, and during the first week, somebody, Dan, asked the million list about connections between computing the ring of integers and other problems in number theory. And I actually tracked down a math signet review of a paper um, which says the following. I'll just read this to you. The result of Christoph says that finding the ring of integers OK in an algebraic number field is equivalent under certain polynomial time reductions to the problem of finding the largest square free divisor of a positive integer. No feasible polynomial time algorithm is known for the latter problem. And it is possible that it is no easier than the more general problem of factoring integers. So this is suggestive that, well, this proves under certain hypotheses that computing OK as you vary over all K is uh, the same in difficulty as computing the largest square free part of the discriminant. And that, people suspect, is just as hard as factoring. That's kind of surprising, but it seems like that might be. There's no way to do that without just factoring your number. It's not like polynomials, where if you have a polynomial, how do you find the largest, how do you find like the square free part of a polynomial, or the squares that divide a polynomial? Derivative. GCD with its derivative. Yeah, it's really easy, just GCD with its derivative. Um, it would be very nice if you could do that with integers. You know, take an integer and you want to find its square free part or the squares that divide it, GCD with the derivative. But then you just get the integer map and it doesn't. <laughs> so that doesn't work. Um, and there's no like really clever arithmetic analog that we know of, at least for the derivative of an integer, that at least you can compute. Um, Alright, so back to our story. It seems stuffy in here. Is it just me or...? Yeah, it's stuffy. Actually, could somebody rotate the camera over this direction? It's only on this one. Oh, thanks. You could just like pick the tripod up. Or... So, so here's some um, here's a specific example and some geometric intuition about it. So, first, let's take a quote large prime, namely two to the sixteen plus one, which is sixty-five thousand five hundred thirty-seven, and let's look at the ring of integers z adjoint i, and then. Oops, six. So this prime, which I call P, P, this factors as the ideal generated by P and two to the eighth plus I, and the ideal generated by P and two to the eighth minus I. So this is an example of factoring a prime, a sort of big prime, in the ring of integers of a field. And there's a lot of different questions that we'll answer in the course of this course about you know, how many different primes can there be, what special structure does this factorization have. It actually has a very, very nice special structure in the case of an extension is gamma. Um, what kind of relations are there between the degrees of the primes, that is the, uh, if you consider OK mod PI, then you get a finite field, and that has a degree over its prime subfield. So what's the relation between that degree, the number of primes, and the exponents that appear? So those are the sort of things we'll answer as the course progresses. Okay, so this is just one example of a factorization. So geometric intuition, which uh, I use quite a lot actually for what we're doing. So um, in general, we'll think of spec of OK, the collection of all prime ideals of OK, as a as a scheme over spec of z. And this whole issue of factoring primes, you can think about it geometrically as follows. You're just um, considering this prime ideal p times z. This is a point of spec of z. The elements of the set spec of z are exactly the primes like this and the zero ideal, because those are the primes of spec of z. The points of spec of ok are exactly the primes of ok plus the zero ideal. And when, you're, when you factor PZ, what are you doing? So PZ, it's some product. You know that you can do this uniquely. EI to EI. Notice that um, P is contained in each of these PI like that. 
The reason is because each pi divides p, remember that it contains its divides, and in this factorization, you see that each of the pi divides this. Or put another, I mean, it's, it's also just immediate from, um, from the fact that each of these, this whole product is contained in pi, because a product of ideals is contained in any one of them, because they're ideals. So um, there's a, so this map right here, which I haven't defined yet, and I should define, is the following. And it's actually a completely general notion um, with schemes. If you have spec the spectrum of one ring and the spectrum of another ring, the, um, in this case, there's a homomorphism from Z up to OK. And then there's an induced map in the other direction on schemes, which is inverse image. So given a prime ideal a point P of X, it maps via this map to the inverse image. I'll call this little this map right here phi. It maps to phi inverse of P, which is a point in Y. And what is, I mean, after all, what is phi inverse of P? That's this just the intersection of P with Z. Because phi is just the, the uh, natural inclusion of Z into OK. So if you take a prime ideal P that, um, that contains, if you take a prime ideal Gothic P in um, O sub K, then, and it's one of the factors appearing in the factorization of little p, then what is the intersection of that prime with the integers? Well, it's, some, it's a general fact that if you take the inverse image under homomorphism of any prime ideal, you always get a prime ideal. So whatever you, you get, it's a prime ideal. And it clearly contains p, so it has to be the ideal generated by p. So that's what you get here. Um, so if you think about this map right here, so upstairs you have spec of OK, which is this scheme that looks like the following. You have you know, a whole bunch of different primes. And of course, you have this generic point, which is the ideal generated by 0. And down here, you have a whole bunch of primes. 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And then um, so a gray line is the ideal generated by 0. Uh, with the topology you put on these specs, the closure of the zero ideal um, gives you everything. That's why it's a generic point. So um, if you look at the primes that appear in the factorization of some ideal down here, so if we take P to be, say, that prime right there, 65,537, then we factor it. Notice that each of these primes, there are primes up here that under this map from spec of OK down to spec of Z map to P. So here you have the ideal generated by P, and in this case, 2 to the 8 plus I. And here you have the ideal generated by P, and 2 to the 8 minus I. So because of this geometric picture, people very often um, think of the primes that divide P in this factorization as the primes lying over P. So that's a typical uh, phraseology that people would use. So these two primes right here, these are the primes lying over P, lying over 65,537. So when you factor a prime, what you're actually doing is finding the primes that lie over it. In other words, this whole question of factoring primes geometrically is the same as computing given a point on this curve, spec of Z. I say curve because it's a one-dimensional scheme. Finding the fiber over that point up here. In fact, in a precise scheme theoretic sense, it really is exactly finding the fiber. Because, um, so the naive notion of fiber is it's just the inverse image of a point. The more precise notion of the fiber over a point in the sense of algebraic geometry is the following. You view the point as a morphism from some, uh, in this case, field to spec of Z. And then you take the fiber product, and that gives you the fiber over the point. So I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. So here we have spec of Z. And then mapping into spec of Z, we have spec of FP, or P of prime. This inclusion is induced by the map from Z to Z mod PZ, or from Z to, to FP. And 
You know, if you have that map, you take the one prime ideal here, take its inverse image over here, what do you get? If you, you know, if you have the map from Z to FP and you take the inverse image of the prime ideal of FP in Z, what prime ideal do you get? It's just the ideal generated by P. So the image of this map, at least on sets, is just a single point in the prime ideal generated by P. And then you have this map down to spec OK to spec Z. And now the fiber product is by definition spec of the tensor product, which in this case is OK tensor over Z with FP. And we have a diagram of this. And this right here, OK tensor FP, this is just exactly the same thing as um, it's OK mod P OK. But as we'll see using the Chinese remainder theorem a little later, OK mod, um, OK mod P OK is isomorphic to OK Mod, well, this is, you don't need Chinese remainder for this so far. It's just product pi to ei. But then with the Chinese remainder theorem, you see that this is um, spec of the direct sum of rings um, OK mod p1 to e1, direct sum dot to dot, direct sum OK mod pi to ei, or whatever, however many there are, maybe pi to the ei. And then the general fact about spec is the spectrum of the direct sum of two commutative rings is the disjoint union of the spectrums of the two rings. Just the set of prime ideals of the direct sum of two rings is the disjoint union. So, um, so this you can write as the disjoint union over i going from 1 to r spec of OK mod pi to the ei. Okay? So, in a very precise sense, computing the factorization of a prime in Z is really exactly the same thing as computing the fiber in as precise of a sense as you want of um, the map from spec OK to spec Z over the point P. Okay, any questions about that? Which one yes. is easier? It's just language. Um, okay. It's conceptually nice to think of both of them. They're, neither one is easier than the other. They're completely equivalent ideas. It's just that since so often in algebraic number theory they talk about a prime line over another prime, the splitting behavior, and so on, ramification, every, all this terminology is directly motivated by this um, geometric picture that um, like growth and popularized a lot in the 50s and 60s. Um, in fact, if you, well, if you, um, let me show you another example actually that that illustrates this idea of ramification in this context. So this is a this example I'll spend some time on. Um, I'm going to take the number field defined by a root of the polynomial x to the fifth plus seven x to the fourth plus three x squared minus x plus one. So this is a degree five number field. And it turns out that if A is a root of F, then Z adjoin A is equal to OK. So that's a fact which um, could be shown somehow by doing a calculation of the discriminant, finding the square factors in it, and so on. Um, so here's what happens if you take the ideal 5 and factor it. I'm going to show you how you can do this by hand in a moment. So, again, what you should imagine is you have the integer z here. So you have a point 2, a point 3, point 5, 7, and so on. And then you have the, um, you have some curve like thing here, which, let me put this picture right. Well, it's hard to, to do globally, but. So you have some curve here which you can think of as spec of OK. It doesn't actually look like a physical curve like this. It's an arithmetic construction. Right? It really is this discrete set of points and then one line going through it. Um, I think I, let's 
More like that. Okay. Uh, that what happens over here. So maybe it looks like this. Uh, so it's some sort of curve up here, and it's mapping down to spec and sequence. And here's what happens. If you take the ideal 5 and factor it, you find that there are exactly three prime ideals that lie over it. In particular, if you just say use a computer and factor 5, here's what you get. So you see that 5 OK is the ideal generated by 5 and 2 plus a times the ideal generated by 5 and 3 plus a squared times the ideal generated by 5 and 2 plus 4 times a plus a squared. So here you have three prime ideals. And notice there's one where the exponent is 2. That's what I've represented here. It's like ramification. It's like some point where you have some extra multiplicity. So you know with algebraic curves, when you have a map between algebraic curves, for example, uh, there's a quadratic curve and a line and a map, um, there can be finitely many points where the map is ramified, points where the uh, cardinality counting appropriately, the cardinality of the fiber over a point is smaller than it is generically. And that's exactly what happens with rings of integers and number fields. Here, Generically, count, counting the degrees of points appropriately, there, um, there are exactly five points over any thing. So here, this point counts double, because that factor has degree two. We only get a doubly big point. But if you count out the multiplicities appropriately, generically, you'll have five points over any given point. But every once in a while, you'll have less than five. The primes that have that property are called the ramified primes. So in this example, five ramifies in A. And as I mentioned before, there'll be only finally many such primes. The primes that ramify must divide the discriminant of the ring of integers, so they could be only finally many. I haven't proved that yet. So now let me show you um, just a little teaser, and then show you how you can usually factor primes very, very easily. Notice if you take the polynomial f, which I wrote over there, and the factor of modulo 5, here's what you get. So f factor of modulo 5 is x plus 2 times, write this lower, is equal to x plus 2 times x plus 3 squared times x squared plus 4x plus 2. Okay, so that's how you factor it. Do you see any relation between f factored mod 5 and what I wrote up here? So, OK, so uh, yeah, suspense is over. Usually, it's really, really easy to factor. All you do is you take the defining polynomial of your number field factor at mod p. And then for each of the factors, you read off um, what goes here on the right-hand side from what you see in the factorization. Simple as that. Uh, basically, the primes that lie over your prime down here, for all the finitely many of them, they are generated by the prime downstairs, p, and x minus, well, basically you just take the other, you take each of the factors, and you include, with multiplicity, you take each of the factors, and you just replace the x by the indeterminate, that, or the, you know, the generator of the, of the field. That's it. And that works for all the finitely many primes. So now um, I'm going to say a few words just to prove that to you and um, give you a sense of how you can tell whether or not that works in a particular case. Let's see. Yes? If we had something where OK was not just Z adjoining a root of that yep. polynomial, yep. and you know, we can say, well, it's still some primitive element, mm -hmm. primitive element there, would it be the root of the polynomial or the primitive element? That That's a great question. Out? So your question is basically, um, What's your name again? Sorry. Mike. Mike. So Mike's question, again, is, um, well, let's say you're, you have some number field. Actually, I think I have an example here. Uh, but I don't need to get an example. Say you have some number field where 
Um, you happen to stupidly write down a polynomial where z adjoint, a root of that polynomial definitely doesn't generate the ring of integers. You could easily make such a thing here by just replacing a by 5 times a, computing its minimal polynomial, and then making that the polynomial that you use. And then you get something of index um, divisible by 5 inside of O sub k. So that could be one thing that could happen. Um, another, well, so in other words, you could have accidentally chosen your polynomial badly so that a root of it doesn't generate. And then you might hope, well, you could just choose some other polynomial. I mean, maybe there's something like the primitive element theorem, but for rings of integers. So a ring of integer, a um, ring of integers, a maximal order, these are synonyms, is called monogenic if it's generated by one thing. There's some way to generate it by one thing. Not every ring of integers is monogenic. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. And it can even be difficult to decide which, given one a priori. Um, that implementing a, finding an algorithm to do that in general, and implementing it in Sage would be a good project for the course, I think a good final project. It would take as input a number field, and it would output either yes, this is monogenic, generated by this element, or no, there exists none that work. Um, so, let's see. Let me actually skip ahead and just I actually have an example of a non-monogenic field and a proof modulo something that I haven't shown you yet that it's not monogenic. That is, it can't be generated by a single thing. So I'll show you that um, right now. So just to write something on the blackboard, which is useful, a ring or of uh, integers OK is monogenic. If there's some alpha in OK with OK equal to Z adjoint alpha. And I, I don't know anything actually about the density of number fields that are monogenic or not. I don't know if 100% of them are or 0% or what. I, when I, whenever I see this definition, I wonder about that question. I try a bunch of random examples. And very often they do turn out to be monogenic. But my examples are really wimpy because I'm just you know, making up a few small polynomials. So that would be potentially another question I'd be very interested in doing something about just the density of you know, all cubic number fields, how often are they monogenic, et cetera. So quadratic fields, they're all monogenic. Cubic fields, maybe they always are. I don't know. Um, actually, I think I have an example to show they aren't. And uh, in my notes coming up. So cubic fields aren't always monogenic, but how often are they? What about Galois cubic fields? So let me show you an example. So let's take this cubic field. So the cubic field is the one given by a root of x cubed plus x squared minus 2x plus 8. So here it is. And now um, I will tell you that 2 times OK factors as a product of three primes, um, where those primes are the following. I'm just going to write this down. 1 half, so here, um, so let's let A be a root of F. So we're considering A equals Q to join A. So 2 OK. Just computing using Sage using the factor integer command, um, I typed k dot factor integer of uh, 2, and it output the following 1 half a squared minus 1 half a plus 1 times, so in fact it's a principal ideal, um, times a squared minus 2a plus 3 times 3 halves a squared minus 5 halves a plus 4. So there you are. This uh, factors as a product of those three principal ideals. Um, it turns out, I mean, I could write them as 2 and something else, but um, I don't have to because, in fact, they're all principal. Moreover, notice that I'm not getting this factorization just by factoring f mod 2. Because that doesn't always work. It only works for all the family many primes. If you factored f mod 2, you would just get um, x squared times x plus 1 mod 2. And that's not at all 
just completely mislead you about what's going on. You actually be completely wrong. So you have to you have to know something. You have to do a little work. So um, here you have this. I'm just going to ask you to believe this. You could you could check that it's true after the fact, or you could use the algorithm I'll talk about on Friday to compute this. Which you would not. You definitely don't want to do by hand. I mean, this general factoring. You don't find it in any books except Henri Cohn's book, and it's not the sort of thing you want to do by hand. It's hard. When you do it, I computer that. Working yeah. for all but five of the many primes, mm -hmm. that means you pick any f, and that f will work for all but yes. five of the many primes. That's right. Except you don't know. Well, it's just that the only thing you have to worry about is prime c squared divides the discriminant of f. Okay, so that's the yeah, okay. that's the condition. And here, this pretty much it looks you know the discriminant is divisible by two, probably highly divisible by two because you have two roots that are the same law two. So the discriminant is divisible by two. Even without computing it, you know that. If you take this mod two, it has a multiple root, which means the discriminant is divisible by two. Because the discriminant of a polynomial tells you the primes for which it, the roots coincide. Or you, some roots coincide. Now let me convince you, just from what I've written on the blackboard, which I'm going to ask you to assume, that this is not monogenic. The ring of it, this number field is not monogenic. So claim k. Okay. Is, or OK, I should say. OK is not monogenic. There is, by the way, a bad habit of number theorists who often just confuse OK and K in statements. And I don't know why, but uh, I do it all the time, too. Like you're talking about the discriminant of K or all kinds of things where you really need OK. Um, so, OK is not monogenic. So here's why. Um, let's just assume that it were monogenic, OK? And then deduce a contradiction. Proof. If OK is E adjoined B, then what you have is that, let's say G of B is 0, um, then, or actually with g of b equal to 0, uh, then watch what goes wrong. So if this were the case, then you could certainly factor 2 by just factoring g modulo 2. Because, uh, well, I haven't proved that for you yet, but that was something I intend to do. Let me make, in order to finish this, I, I will state a proposition and then um, say some words about how to prove it. But it should be believable based on the example I'm erasing right now. Um, so here's a nice proposition. If P, uh, so the notation carefully. The proof is not hard at all, especially given the amount of commuted algebra you know already. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, so let's say f in z adjoin x and f of a equals 0. This is an irreducible polynomial, irreducible one. Um, f of a is 0. If P does not divide the index OK colon ZA by the index of the order generated by A in the full ring of integers. Here, O sub K is the ring of integers of Q adjoin A. If you have this condition, then um, uh, then Then p times ok is product pi the ei, where, it's just like what I'm already seeing, so where pi is equal to the ideal generated by p and f bar i of a, um, where, sorry for the two words in a row, where f bar is product fi to 
the bar to the EI mod E. In other words, it's just what I erased and had said in words. If you take any prime that doesn't divide this index, then you can factor that prime by simply factoring the polynomial f modulo p, and then you read off the exponents and generators for these prime ideals from that factorization. So that's what I wrote here. So now let's see what would go wrong. Let's just practice using this proposition over here. So what goes wrong? You have this g that has degree 3. And now you take it, and you imagine that g, it's like the f over here. When you factor it, it's supposed to give you the prime factorization of 2. So take a degree 3 polynomial over f2 and factor it. Now we know, because uh, of a different algorithm, which and also just writing it down explicitly, that 2 factors as a product of 3 distinct primes. That tells us that g bar has to factor as a product of 3 distinct polynomials modulo 2. Is it possible for a polynomial of degree 3 to split as a product of 3 linear factors that are distinct modulo 2? Why not? Right, right, darn it up. There's only two linear polynomials mod 2, so you can't have that happen. There's no possible way that this g, so uh, we can't have g equal to the product uh, g1 times, so g bar equals the product g1 times g2 times g3 bar mod 2, but the gi is all distinct. gi bar is distinct. It just can't happen. So that means that OK can't possibly be monogenic because if it were, we get a contradiction. So this, this order is not generated by a single element, no matter which one you choose. You're never going to find some single element that works. There's no algorithm to do that. Okay. Um, by the way, you can always generate an order by two elements. And I think we'll be able to prove that as well using the Chinese remainder theorem. So, there, there, there exist two elements so that that's not monogenic, it's whatever, bionic genic, <laughs> biogenic, <laughs> bigenic, yeah, bigenic. It's uh, always bigenic. <laughs> is that a general that you can see? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. But I don't know. So Robert Diller's question is, are the statements I just made here true for a general dedicated domain? And I, I just don't know. Maybe I'll put that in the homework. I think I remember that being like, like one more generator. Could be. Could be. Probably. Probably it's, it's general. I, I actually I don't know off the top of my head. Um, we'll see when we do the proof, probably, I think. But we might end up using that the question rings are all, I mean, the question fields are finite. That gives you some extra capabilities. Um, and I mentioned this before, but if you just allow arbitrary orders, then you can, then you may need arbitrarily many generators. And um, when I taught this course as an undergrad course three years ago, I gave that as a figuring out an explicit example of that, a challenge to the students. And one student was able to solve it. And he gave an example of a, you know, a way to construct an order that requires as many generators as you want. So. But I forgot what it is. So you just did it in front of the class and you didn't write it down. Yes. So. But you can, you, arbitrarily many can be required. OK, so I only have a little bit of time. So I'm just going to give you kind of a sketch of why this is true. And um, next time, we'll talk about this more general method for factoring, which works even at the bad primes. So here, this is pretty easy. It reduces everything to factoring a polynomial over a finite field, which, I mean, that's a whole other ball of uh, whatever, um, ball of rubber bands, but, um, but it, it's pretty easy in practice. So just a sketch of the proof of this proposition. Um, how do I want to phrase this? I mean, the, the basic idea is that if you think about z join x mod the ideal f of x, uh, factoring, so this is, um, 
So this is contained in OK because if it's contained in there and the index is co prime to P. This is contained in the sense that there's a, a, a natural injective map sending x to A, the root, and this index is co prime to P. So uh, the two things that you have to do is think about how would you factor P in this ring? In other words, um, what does this ring modulo P look like? So factoring it is the same as computing the structure of the ring Z adjoint X modulo P and F of X. So if you in addition mod out by P, uh, what do you get? Well, here it's really easy. You just factor F modulo P and um, that gives you the factorization, that gives you the structure of this ring. Um, the reason is just because you can factor out, you can mod out by P first. So this is really FP adjoint X modulo F bar of X. And then you use the Chinese remainder theorem for a polynomial ring over field. So understanding how factorization works over here is pretty easy. Um, the problem is, how do you relate it to what happens over here? Well, you just use it, the index is co prime to P to see that there's really no difference in what's going on over here versus what's going on over there. And I'm um, actually out of time, but uh, it's just the fact that the index is co prime to P tells you there's no difference between the behavior in these two situations. And the general algorithm is you start with something like this and then you enlarge it so that the index of the enlarged order in OK is co prime to P, and then you factor here. So that's really the extra step you have to do. And the key thing is because you, you do everything locally at P, it's fast. You don't have to factor anything. OK, so I'll start on that at the beginning next time. I encourage you to look a little more at the details of the proof of this proposition in the notes, especially because one of your homework problems is to slightly refine what I proved in the notes. So, I'm not definitely into much of that. But it's all written down here. And you might want to read down the chapter 5 since I made a bunch of changes this morning. Yes? When you're looking at uh, whether you're monogenic or not, yes. you only need to check for equal to. Is that only where you use this kind of That's product? not true. That's not true because that was my example. But I think you can have examples that involve other primes. And just two. The degree, maybe for a degree three field, all you have to do is check it. Okay, the index is okay to Z and join A. If you think you. Oh, 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 right, right. The index is okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm confusing the number generator. Right. Yeah. Can yeah. you come in the side of the homework right. today? What time? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll swim on by Okay, yeah, yeah, so let's say.